we're mad. We're fat. And, and we're, we're loud. loud. And it has been a good first quarter for us so far this year for the heavyweight chumps. Joining us again here in the empty arena studio, the man who might know more about the women of the White House than the men that lived with them. <laughs> That's right. Joining us again is one of our audience's favorite guests, the First Lady's Man, Mr. Andrew Oak. What's up, fella? Hey, man, Andy, it's good to have you back on. We always, this is always our educational episode for some. Oh, you know, it's kind of, we, we put on our smoking jackets and, and, and break our, our encyclopedias and, and and and, uh, and and pipes and ascots and 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 add a little culture to uh, to 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 life and and breathe breathe some life into into a subject that tantalizes some others avoid but 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 it's there and we should consider because as you and I talk you know outside the live broadcast or outside of the podcast you know it's it's just about human beings getting along with human beings I'm first ladies man I focus on first ladies but I bring it all into perspective just to say that these women have been part Partners in leadership from the very beginning. They've always been in the room, and and the concepts like lean in and me too and equal rights and ERA and and all that kind of stuff is important. But it's important to understand understand on on the grand scheme of things. This is the way it is. Men couple with women. Women give their husbands advice long before they could vote. Long before they were uh, formally educated before they had jobs, before they were out of the houses, off the plantations, all that kind of stuff. Men have had these women in their lives as these partners, as these consultants, as these advisors uh, uh, on so many different levels into the White House through presidential administrations. That it's not The only thing I'm trying to change here is that we recognize that they've been here. This, this demographic has been part of the intellectual uh, infrastructure of, of our uh, country and our system from the very beginning, and that's why today, on President's Day, I, I take a page out of Abigail Adams' playbook, her direct writing letters, and say, remember the ladies on President's Day. You're right to remember the ladies, and that's something that I think, you know, we've been educated about the importance of the First Ladies by having you on a couple of times before now. And we felt like President's Day would be a good time for more people to to tune in and to learn a little bit more. And especially um, Abigail Adams, who is, is credited for saying, remember the ladies. But maybe people don't understand exactly what she meant when she was saying, remember the ladies. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, Remember the Ladies is a quote that is attributed to Abigail Adams because she wrote it in a letter in the late 1700s to her husband, uh, John Adams, as John Adams is one of the men uh, of the Continental Congress. He is one of the great minds that started this country. He's one of the great minds that put together the um, the Declaration of Independence, the, the Bill of Rights, you know, all these other things. He's the first vice president, the second president of the United States. And Abigail Adams and John Adams wrote to each other a lot. Everyone wrote to each other a lot back in, back in those days. Um, but the good thing and the unique thing about Abigail and John Adams is they kept all their letters. Martha Washington, Elizabeth Monroe, a, a, a lot of the early women... Uh, and men alike uh, burn their letters. It's the, it's the colonial version of cleansing your hard drive. You go back, you know, you're on your last legs, you know the light at the end of the tunnel is approaching, you're about to meet your maker, you read through your records one last time for nostalgia, then you throw it in the fireplace because it's really no Everybody's business but your own, you know? Um, uh, and, and Abigail Adams and John Adams 
knew the importance of what they were doing, knew the importance of what was becoming America, and they saved these letters for posterity. So in this, we have a number of writings, and I was fortunate enough, as a producer for the C-SPAN series, First Lady's Influence and Image, I went to the Massachusetts Historical Society, where they have 70,000 pages of Adams Family correspondence. And this goes through a number of generations, and John Quinn Adams and Louisa Catherine Adams, John Adams, Abigail Adams, and they, they all had big families and lots of children, so it's not just John and Abigail, but within that are these letters. So, I was very in, in, uh, curious about this Remember the Ladies, because it seemed as though it was taken out of context, and while a great little soundbite and a great little little quote, Remember the Ladies, I mean, that alone, uh, standing alone, is a legendary statement for a woman to say that in the 1790s. Hundreds of years before they would vote, hundreds of years before they would have formal education, be expected to have jobs, be the, be the outward contributors that they are uh, beyond just housewife and mother and, and things like that, before they would take on all these different roles like everyone else in society. But her letter said, remember the ladies, when you have them on your side, the men will be in your favor. So think about that. When you have them on your side, the men will be in your favor. What Abigail Adams essentially said, and this is, this is, I, I, I know it's gotta be true for you, it's true, it's true for me. When you guys in modern times, and, and most folks, you know, when I, when I speak, when, when you're sitting in your homes, you're sitting in your living rooms in front of your big smart TVs, and you're going through your Netflix, or your DVR, you're watching whatever, who, who in your house is, is whole remote? Me. Exactly. You're the man. You got the power. You're holding that remote. You are the man of the house. It's your TV, your remote. But who's picking the shows? Me. <laughs> so I'm not picking the shows. I'm telling you, Princess Goldenbun pulling up Dateline. This she is not a democracy uh, in this uh, house. Uh, <laughs> Pit bulls and paroles. And well, a lot of people in modern times, as we advance, they get two different TVs and they watch TV in a second. But if you if you look at historically, men and women in relationships that sit and watch TV, men are holding the remote, women are picking the shows. And Abigail Adams knew that in the 1800s and the 1700s, long before electricity. You're Internet, right because most TVs, of the time, all we get to do is turn up the volume. All the Exactly, exactly. And I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's just it's just kind of the way it is. It's the way people interact. It's the way these relationships are. But think about this. If Colonial Andy comes home day before the election, I walk in the door, and Heather's sitting in our Colonial house, and she says, the election's tomorrow. Who are you voting for? I said, well, I was going to vote for John Adams. She says, that's the dumbest thing you've said since we got married. I start to question myself. I said, wow. And that's not the greatest idea. But if I come home, Colonial Andy comes home, Colonial Heather sitting in the living room, and she says, the election tomorrow, who are you voting for? I say, well, I was going to vote for John Adams. She says, honey, that's the smartest thing I've done since you married me. I say, that is a smart thing. And I go down to the pub, and I order up pints of grog or mead uh, you know, for, for all my friends. I say, boys, boys, you're looking at a smart man. You know why I'm a smart man? Because my wife said so. And that's what it is. When, when, when you're in tune with these, ev these events and these laws and these things and you're structuring this country in a way that makes women happy, when you come home, they say, hey, you know, I mean, they can't vote. They are not formally educated. They, 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 don't, they don't have paying jobs. You know, they come with dowries and just ancient colonial kind of stuff. But if that woman is sitting in that house and thinks, man, that John Adams is really something. He cares about me. He's making a better world for my children. Then you're damn straight that woman is going to tell that man, honey, when you go vote tomorrow, you better vote for that John Adams character because he cares about education, he cares about food, he cares about kids, he cares about uh, 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 national security, you know, all this kind of stuff that people are thinking about. And even though they can't vote, their influence is there because it's always been there. And and that's what the remember the ladies quote about. And it's so revolutionary to think that this woman is thinking in terms of that happy wife, that happy life, that coupling, that kind of influence that we have that she says, John, 
If you run a campaign, if you structure a constitution, if you form a country that thinks about women and what they want out of life, you're going to get more men to vote for you because if a man comes home and says he's voting for John Adams and his wife says you're an idiot, you can bet your ass he's going to change his vote because he doesn't want his wife to think he's an idiot. That's how forward-thinking Abigail Adams was. And if he hadn't changed, if any man didn't change his vote after listening to that or reading that letter or hearing what you've said about it, they're dumber than they thought their wives were. Well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, listen, man, I was out last night at, at a Journey tribute show, tr Journey tribute band, and th uh, they had a female lead singer, and she said, okay, guys, it's Valentine's weekend. I know it was Thursday, but here you go, and this is your chance. This is your chance to, to dance with your with your dates, to dance with your wives, dance with your girlfriends, and she said she started playing open arms, and a small handful of guys just didn't care about what other people thought. The only person they saw in that room was their lady, their girl, and picked them up and started throwing them around there. And she said, you know what? There's a handful of guys that are going to get really lucky in this room, and the rest of y'all are in the doghouse because you didn't pick up your lady and dance with her. I mean, that's kind of what it is, you know? And it's 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 like, it's not saying you, know, you have to make women. I mean, you know, there's keep your pappy happy and there's happy wife, happy life. I mean, who wants to be miserable? I know there are those people out there, but for the most part, we all want to be happy. We all want to get along. We want our home life to be good. And, you know, that, that means different things to different people. So, if you're in a happy relationship, then things are moving along happily. And that goes back to colonial times and the structure of our country and Abigail Adams thinking that far in advance, that forward to know that a wife's input and conversations and influence will change the way her husband votes and thus put her husband in office over Thomas Jefferson, say. And Thomas Jefferson wasn't necessarily a, 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 a female thinking man. He wasn't thinking in, in those terms. I'm not saying that's what lost the election for him kind of thing, but a lot of people, when they came to Washington, D.C., when Jefferson was in the White House, they went over to the Secretary of State's house where Dolly Madison was the hostess because Thomas Jefferson would answer the door of the White House in his long johns. And it was like a hunting cab. And he's smoking a cigar and he's got giant stuffed bears and Lewis and Clark bringing, you know, samples of wildlife and, and stuff through there. And, and, and it was just. It was, it was a boys was club, a boys for real, club. yeah. <laughs> It was. No, no joke. No joke. The Jefferson White House was a boys club. I mean, his his daughter, uh, Mary uh, uh, Martha, Martha Jefferson Randolph, ran his White House as far as from a hostessing standpoint when he had formal things that he had to do. But for the most part, it was Dolly Madison who was setting herself up to be the next first lady when her husband won uh, the presidency after Jefferson. But, I mean, you know, she couldn't have foreseen but that's where she got that training for these big parties and this type of, of uh, 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 um, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, hostessing, and politicking, and how she set the table for how things work and where she put the guests and all that. She got a lot of that early training when she was the wife of the Secretary of State, James Madison, for Jefferson's White House, because Jefferson didn't to do it and women didn't want to hang out at the white house because it was all like spittoons and long johns and cigars and and giant stuffed bears all over the place it was like a hunting lodge wasn't like a white house sounds like the country club before they got all wised up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean, i would have had a great time hanging out in the jefferson white house i also would have had a great time over at dolly madison's house with the big fancy parties where you put on your top hat and your tie and all this but it kind of just it just it's it's an introduction into how forward thinking these first ladies are and how they set their husbands up and that's why i bring it up today because i want people to realize that it really has been a partnership in 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 leadership and a, and a partnership in administration through modern times. So when we hear about a first lady having influence in a White House or being in on serious talks and negotiations and cabinet meetings and things like that, we should not be surprised. Martha Washington, we've said on this show before, she traveled at great personal risk to all the winter encampments of the Revolutionary War to advise and counsel and console and be with her husband because he wrote in letters. General George Washington wrote, he said, I don't think straight without my wife at my side. 
I mean, it's 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 why we couple. It's why we partner. There's all kinds of advantages to doing it, and and having someone to bounce that off. I mean, I come home from work, or like today, Heather will ask me, she'll say, "Hey, how'd the podcast uh, with those two chuckleheads go?" I'll say, "Oh, went great, man. It's always a good time, always fun." But but you know, President Trump, President Bush, President Obama, President Clinton, you know, they all these modern presidents, they come home. And their wives will say the same. And I think for a long time, probably that answer when, when Mrs. Obama or Mrs. Trump or Mrs. either of the Mrs. Bushes, you know, how, how's work today, honey? And say, well, Putin's a real pain in my ass and the Middle East is still a wreck. Really? Tell me about it. Okay. Well, this, that. I mean, these women have been privy to this information, but I'm old enough to remember that, that, uh, President Reagan said in the eighties, he said, I don't make a single decision without running it by Nancy. And people went crazy. They thought this was brand new and why it's just that reagan was the first one to say it out loud on tv but they've all been doing it so what i'd like to do now is you tell me about some of your favorite places in america some of the favorite places you you've visited or some of your favorite first ladies and i'll tell you about the places you can go in those states in those places that i went to and and what you can learn about those first ladies how about that can i add one more thing you got to tell us to your to your list Lay it on me. You got to tell us the best thing you ate while you were researching that particular first lady. Oh yeah, well you know you know that's in my <laughs> book, and you know I love to eat, man. I say, and you I know, know you guys love to yeah, eat. Yeah, we're foodies too. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We can do all that. We can do all. I mean, that's kind of my book fell together because I'd never written a book before. I'd never done a project like this before. I mean, I'd I'd done documentaries and I'd done travel and I've done mini series and things like that. But something of this magnitude and with this kind of historical impact and and breaking out this much information that was that was as yet mostly and widely unknown or unrecognized was so monumental and as i traveled along i was by myself uh, 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 all the all the all the field work was done by me. There was a staff, a great staff, wonderful producers and people back at C-SPAN and it was C-SPAN's idea. So the series wasn't even my idea. I just I was the I was the, the the senior producer, traveling producer, series producer that was hired to make all these journeys, make all these travels, and unearth all of these untold or not well known stories and bring them back. And when you're on the road, I mean, what, what else you got to do but but eat? You no, know, you eat and you do your work and you travel to the next show, to you know, the next town, the next thing. You so watch some sports together, in the hotel and you go back about yeah, the next. No, day. It, it, exactly. And sometimes, I tell you, man, I wasn't in San Francisco. For Lou Hoover, twenty four hours. By the time by the time my flight delays and all the other nonsense, getting out of West Branch, Iowa, from the Hoover Museum and Library, the Presidential Library and Museum there, out to uh, San Francisco, studying her and her time meeting President Hoover and going to Stanford University. It wasn't twenty four hours. I was on the ground in San Francisco to do about ten hours worth of work in about six hours. So I mean, it was a mad dash. In a lot of these times, but I'll tell you, I went to this kick-ass little sushi restaurant right by my hotel in uh, in in um, uh, Stanford, California, uh, in Northern California, there by San Francisco, and had a great. Uh, they had all these different kinds of rolls, and the seafood so fresh coming in there right on the coast and over from Japan, and 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 the, the sushi chefs, and it was great. They had this. They had this little uh, 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 in in. In, in uh, indoor rip that sort of ran through the restaurant and after a crazy 48 hours of Lou Hoover to just sit down while all of my media was downloading or uploading you know off my camera off my hard off my my cards my data cards onto my hard drives in the hotel so I could clear them out and go to the next town for the next first lady and all it was nice to just sit in this tranquil beautiful like indoor river garden area and eat just some of the finest freshest sushi I've, I've, I've ever had in my life so yeah we, we can roll through restaurants you got, my, his, you, his, you, you got my co-host drooling over here now I love <laughs> some sushi don't yeah man don't drool on the board you'll fritz it out yeah I'm trying not yeah, to please eat. don't um, <laughs> I'm gonna start I'm, with sh- I think I want to start with one that's a little obscure Okay. Not necessarily obscure, but not one I know a lot about other than Hank Hill named her named his dog after her. And that would be Lady you Bird jo- Lady Bird Johnson. Yeah, well we got a lot in common. I'm a, I'm a big King of the Hill fan too. That's great, great funny show. 
Mike Judge from uh, from Beavis and Butthead and did most of the voices too. I'm sorry, band, but band I band think King of the Hill was a much better show than Beavis and Butthead. Oh, sure. I, that, they both have a they both have a, a a great place in in my memory and 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 in pop culture history. But Lady Bird, you know, that's that's a great call. And 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 there's a couple different places that you can research Lady Bird. Now, the funny thing about Lady Bird, or the interesting thing about Lady Bird, is you really don't have to go to Texas to study her. Lady Bird, her big philanthropy, her big cause was the beautification of America and its road systems. And what she got was she got. Uh, billboards and things pulled back from the road, wildflowers planted, junkyards pulled off the side of highways and roads, and fences put up. So when people travel this great big highway of a country of ours, I mean, we're very unique uh, from a lot of countries in that we love our cars, we love our big long roadways, and we love to travel, we love our big trips. She wanted to do knowing that Americans spent so much time traveling like that because we're just, we're a massive country i mean we've got states like other land maps have countries you know in europe they bounce back and forth from germany to france like we go from you know mississippi to tennessee or maryland to new york or wherever we're going and and we've got this massive land mass that we travel through and and lady bird johnson saw the value in that and and to this day there are laws and things in place and still gardens and things planted along these highways because of lady bird johnson and that also reflected into her uh, official white house china she had wildflower patterns on that it's one of the most beautiful china collections but here's the thing lady bird johnson was born in texas to a fairly well-to-do uh uh family and she got a small, a small, a modest, I'll say, a modest inheritance that she turned into a, into a small little uh, 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 communications uh, business and conglomerate down in Texas. And she owned radio stations and TV stations, and that money that she was uh, that she inherited, she turned into a, into a real nice, uh, well oiled machine and and a, and a, and a, and, a, and a, uh, a very wealthy and, and successful business. So she comes along and meets old LBJ, and he doesn't have the money, and he doesn't have the clout, and he doesn't have stuff, but like many of these men, they were going places. They were rising stars, and women, because they didn't have the ability to vote, uh, they because they didn't have uh, uh, equal pay or the rights or some of the things that we're still dealing with today, the only way they could get their voices, these these upper these upper crust women, these women of... of, of uh, of ability, these women of aptitude, these women of natural intelligence, the only way they could get their voices heard was wag one of these upward moving guys. And she saw the thing. She uh, funded Andy, the you're first breaking up successful bad. congressional campaign. You're, you're, oh, you're, am I? Yeah, your signal's breaking up pretty bad. Uh, well, let me see. I've had some. I've had some phone problems here with AT and T, and they haven't straightened it out. Is this good? Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, you okay. are. Yes. Okay. So, so bot, bottom line is, um, I don't, I don't know how much I broke up there. And I apologize for that. Um, so, so Lady Lady Bird Johnson uh, uh, worked a small inheritance in, uh, into a very successful communications conglomerate of radio stations and television stations in Texas. So when LBJ came along and they met, he used her money and her finances and her support, and she used him equally to, to get her, her opinions and her thoughts and her causes and, 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 her, and, 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 and her brain uh, to be heard by, by, by getting her man in office. And his first congressional, his first successful congressional uh, campaign was funded largely by, by his wife, by Lady Bird Johnson. So here's where you go. Here's where you go to learn the most about Lady Bird Johnson. There's two spaces, really. One is more official and one is more personal. The, um, the National Archives and Records Administration runs and operates all of the presidential libraries and museums from uh, President Hoover all the way up through George H.W. Bush. Uh, those are the ones that are in existence that are run by NARA. And in Austin is a very cool presidential library and museum, the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and Museum. And here's a cool thing that I know. All of these libraries contain apartments 
for the president and first lady that they can stay in and work in and have offices in for when they throw events and things at their parties. And they're put together by their presidential foundations that work hand in hand with the library. So way up at top of the LBJ Museum that you can see the state capitol of Austin, the state capitol building, and you can look over the uh, the uh, Hook'em, Hook'em Horns Texas University uh, football stadium is the LBJ uh, library office and i had the good fortune of being uh shown all around the place by one of lady bird's former social secretaries during her post white house years and she told me a lot about another place that i went to to study in the in the in the low the low rolling hills of, of stonewall texas outside of austin it's about an hour drive outside of austin and that's where the lbj ranch is and that was their Camp David. That was their summer White House. That was their, you know, where, wherever Trump goes down to um, Mar, Mar del Largo, del Largo, wherever he goes down to, to golf. And, and President Obama used to love to go to, uh, to Maui and out to Martha's Vineyard. Well, the, 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 uh, the Johnsons had the ranch down there in Stonewall, uh, Texas. And it's, it's the only presidential retreat that had a full blown airstrip landing strip where he could land one of the smaller air force one plane went back and forth so much well lbj the president lyndon b johnson died very very shortly after he got out of the white house heart attack kind of thing and lady bird lives a lot longer than lbj and one of the things she used to love 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 to do was entertain out at the ranch and here's the coolest part she would research all of her guests. She, she would do it herself or have her staff find out what books they were reading, what they wanted to do, what temperature they liked the house, what their favorite foods are, and all this stuff. So she would go out to the ranch ahead of time for these guests going and have their books, their favorite magazines on the nightstand, uh, uh, have, have um, you know, clothes that were their size, all their favorite foods in the refrigerator so they could really spend special time with her out at the ranch. And one guy in particular, city slicker all he wanted to do was be like a cowboy so he wanted to go out there and ride the range and all this other stuff and then she had a pair of wrangler jeans a red bandana a cowboy hat all this stuff in his size ready for him waiting on his bed when he got to the uh ranch and got a horse ready for him and a saddle and just put him out on the range all the time guy the time of his life and she would go there ahead of time to make sure all the faucets worked and all the guest bathrooms and all the outlets worked to make sure light bulbs were in the lamps. She was a really, really just a, a the quintessential hostess and make sure that all of her guests uh, were, were, uh, were well, well attended to and, and, and all the accommodations were, were, were in check. So I thought that was a really neat fact and, and all of those things you can find down there in and around Austin, Texas. You know, and Lady Bird is one of those that you don't, you don't hear a lot when it comes to first lady. She's one of those that you hear the name, but you don't hear much about her, uh, philanthropic work. Like you said, I didn't know she yeah, was behind the beautification she, of the road system. I mean, that's, yeah, well, she's, she's, she's also, you know, the history is a funny thing. She falls in between, um, you know, Nixon and Kennedy. And those are two massive, presidential administrations each for their own different reasons and, and places in pop culture assassinations Jacqueline Kennedy was so popular Watergate all this other stuff LBJ falls right in the middle of uh, and, and uh, his, his whole thing almost gets overshadowed by Vietnam and you don't even you don't even link Johnson with with Vietnam because there's so much other stuff going on and and lady bird then sort of you know can 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 fall aside for there but another thing is there's a number of tapes and for as for as big and and old and and outspoken and 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 uh uh, uh big old texan you know that lbj was there are there are audio tapes of meetings between uh, uh president johnson and lady bird johnson and after each of his speeches and all the stuff he does she says, okay, well, this was good, and this was not good, and you need to stand up straighter, and you need to speak a little more clearly, and you slurred this word, and this word you said incorrectly, and you got to sound sharp. And, this, and everything that, that Lady Bird says, you hear uh, President Johnson say, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I understand, ma'am. I mean, it's like she was right there helping him craft his image, craft his 
his public persona and all of the, the, the things that he would do publicly. So a highly influential and involved uh, first lady for, to, to, for, sh for sure. And, um, and, and just one, one, one to be remembered. She, she's definitely a, a, a powerful, powerful lady. Where do you want to go from here, Devin? I don't um you got a first lady that Well, oh, oh you, one one thing I got to tell you before is when when you're in Austin, ah, eat, Texas at Sam's, food. eat at Sam's barbecue. And 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 Sam's is so great because Sam himself is a character and you're basically eating in his house. He'll he'll serve you right out of his living room, which he's converted into this sort of counter and 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 uh, 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 hot plates and stuff from when he cooks in the back and out back and all of his smokers and stuff. And you basically go out onto his screened-in porch. You get your soda from a soda machine if you want beer. You walk across the street and and buy it. But man, he just I walked in with my buddy Bircho, who lives down there, was taking me around town. He goes. Do you like beef? And I said, yeah. And he handed me like just his bare hands, pulled right off the meat, all right off the right off the big chunk of meat, and handed me the, the brisket, and I ate it. He goes, you like sausage? I said, yeah. Cut off a sliver of sausage. I'm eating that. You like chicken? Yeah, great. He goes, all right, I got you covered. He opens up this big like to go container, throws a bunch of meat in there, puts a big spoonful of potato salad. I said, could I get coleslaw instead of potato salad? He goes, don't have coleslaw. Got potato salad. I said, great. <laughs> Potato salad it is. He threw four <laughs> pieces of white bread in there, shrugged, and said, give me 11 bucks. I'm like, no problem, dude. Gave him 11 bucks, pulled a Coke Zero out of the soda machine for, you know, 75 cents, and sat with a bunch of people, and we just ate into the wee hours of the morning, man. We were there all night eating and laughing and yucking it up, man. But Sam's oh. Barbecue, he says, it's, it's, you don't need teeth to eat my meat. That's his slogan painted right on the side of the house. <laughs> That's a damn T-shirt right there. <laughs> oh, for sure. Sam's a character, man. You get down there, you tell him the first ladies' man sent you. He'll know what you're talking about. Uh oh, we got to try this one. We definitely. Now, all right, your turn. What's a uh, name a first lady that interests you, Devin? I know there's got to be one. I've got a couple more in my mind. Well, it's not so much uh, a particular lady; it's more of an area. I, I'm kind of curious as what's come out of Arizona. Went out there for vacation when I was a child and fell in love with Arizona. Arizona. Okay, wow. All right, so you're going way out west. Um, there's there's no first lady from Arizona. Uh, uh, the closest we came would be the McCain's. But, you know, you talk about that expansion and that moving west, and there is so much going on in California, which is very, very close to California, which is very, very close to Arizona, or a short little plane ride. So once we get to the Hoover administration and get west of the Mississippi <coughs> and the country expands, I mean, you got to think the beginning part, the beginning half of our country Ohio was like way out west, you know, and, and most of our presidents and first ladies all come from Ohio, Virginia, and New York. And then you start to expand out. Now, a lot of, a lot of presidents and first ladies have gone out and visited. Uh, the Hoovers in particular, uh, were in Las Vegas and you got the Hoover Dam and things like that named for them and things like that. But Arizona, I've actually spent a lot of time in other workout in Arizona, but the closest I can get you there, we already talked about Texas, would be California. California, and there's a lot of first ladies and first lady presence in California. The Hardings took a trip out there when the first railroad, uh, you know, was put in and that cross country railroad expansion happened. The Hardings went out there to, uh, to California. It's actually where, where President Harding died, uh, at his, at his heart attack when he was on a trip out there. And that's when, uh, Calvin Coolidge and Grace Coolidge get the call in, in Plymouth Notch, Vermont to let him know in the, in the early 1920s that he had been promoted from vice president to president because of the death of the president. But, um, but three, three first ladies that, that strike me out in California are, um, Nixon, Pat Nixon, um, who also, uh, Pat Nixon was, was born in, in, um, Nevada. Now that I think about it, her, her father, <coughs> excuse me. And, and I know that she asked about Arizona, but you got Nevada. We're talking about just sort of the area and the region. Um, and, uh, uh, Pat Nixon born out there and then raised as her family moved to California. And you've got Lou Hoover, whose family moved from Iowa to uh, California. He, her father was a banker and was seeking his fortune out there. You've also got Nancy Reagan. Uh, Nancy Reagan was born in New York, actually, and then spent a lot of time being raised by her aunt and uncle in Bethesda, Maryland. 
of, of all places. Uh, while her mother was seeking fame and fortune as an actor, then her mother remarried and settled in, in Chicago, where Nancy Reagan would be formally educated before she went out to California and, and to find uh, fame and fortune and, and her true love, Ronald Reagan. So you've got a lot of different areas in California, all the way from Northern California down to Southern California or Central California, Yorba Linda, which is where the Nixon Museum is. And there's so much to find out about these women. I'll just tell you, you know, Nancy Reagan, what you, what you learned, what I learned was the true love story that was the Reagans. And I think they really, really saw each other in ways that just other people didn't see them. You know, I mean, even, even outside of politics and outside of the, the Hollywood romance, they were just so hopelessly in love with each other. Um, uh, and the love letters that are represented and the tokens that they would give each other made them very real because, you know, we, we often, these presidents and first ladies are larger than life because they're, they're paintings in history books and they're, and they're, uh, uh, they're, 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 they're oil paintings on the wall. They're pages in these books. You don't think of them as real people that live, laugh, love, win, lose, but they are, you know, and when you see these little anniversary gifts and these letters and these tokens that they give each other that these museums sometimes represent with a couple like the Reagans, it makes them all that much more personal. Then, when you get down to Yorba Linda, you see love letters between Richard Nixon and Pat Nixon. And Pat Nixon's nickname when she was in the White House was Plastic Pat because she didn't say anything. She just sat back and and, and when Watergate hit, she was so uh, busted up by it. But what a lot of people don't know is that when they were young and outside of the public eye and outside of the persona of politics, those two had a, a really flirty and cute and romantic love affair. And it's in their letters. It's in these letters that they wrote back and forth to each other with nicknames and talk about they gave you know uh nixon gave pat a, a clock at one point and they named the clock and the clock was broken and they made jokes about it being right twice a day and how she burned the hamburgers because she didn't know what time dick was coming over and and the two of them actually met in a local theater group a community theater group in California, and so the, the the Nixons taught me a lot about about this love story between these couples, and um and when you go to places like Yorba Linda and 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 the uh, and Stanford University, as as I mentioned for for Lou Hoover, you know, up there in Northern California, uh, you get to see a very very personal side of these people. And, and see different parts of the country and different parts of California that I, uh, that I never would have seen. And, um, and, and, uh, it's just great. And when I was out there, uh, researching, uh, Pat Nixon and, and reading all these love letters of hers and, and, and discovering about the, the trip to China, the legendary trip to China and how the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. got its first panda because of Pat Nixon. And it was all over a trip. They went to the zoo and then Pat Nixon was a smoker and she was sitting at this dinner. And, and one of the foreign dignitaries up at the Japanese, you know, the, the, uh, 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 diplomacy was, was up there at the head table. And Pat looked down. And she goes, Oh, look, panda cigarettes. Those pandas were so cute at the zoo today. Would you mind if I had a cigarette? And the guy says, Yeah, you can have a cigarette. He goes, Do you want a couple of pandas too? He was flirting with Pat Nixon, trying to look like a big shot. So he sent us two pandas. And that's how the United States got pandas all over Pat Nixon bumming a smoke at some fancy dinner in China. Uh, these stories are just incredible, and they're only told at these locations. And now, of course, through my books, uh, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and Volume 2. You can get them at firstladiesman.com. I know you guys have given a, a, a set away, and, and other people have bought them because they hear me on this show, on this podcast, which I greatly appreciate. But there's just so much cool stuff to go to, to all these museums and libraries, in addition to uh, the smaller places and the, 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 the lesser-known uh, 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 facilities that house a lot of these historical collections. I think, I got, and I'm kind of going with some obscure first ladies that I didn't hear a lot about, kind of where my questions are this time. Yeah, uh, do it. Uh, Mrs. Ford. Mrs. Ford, okay. You know, the Fords also spent a lot of time in, in California, and, and they also went skiing in Colorado, so there's a lot of different places to go to the Fords. But um, Mrs. Ford is 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 so highly influential 
and so highly important to every man, woman, child, even animal on planet Earth. No matter what color, what country, what religion, it, it, old, young, Mrs. Ford publicly and openly for the first time of any human being at this level went through two afflictions that affect directly or indirectly every human being on earth and that's cancer and addiction betty ford had breast cancer if you go back in history one of the adamses one of one of john and abigail adams's daughters in the 1800s had a mastectomy because of breast cancer we've known what cancer is cancer has been around since the beginning of time since man walked upright since before man walked upright and cancer has been there but no one has gone through it as publicly as Betty Ford did before Betty Ford. So the reason that there's a breast cancer walk or, or pink ribbons or any kind of research or anything on the level that it is in the fundraising is because Betty Ford did it on the world stage. And she talked about it. And she talked about women's rights. And she talked about addiction when her family had an intervention and said, you got problems with pills? You got problems with alcohol, mom? I mean, that was stuff that everybody pushed under the carpet. And she opened up publicly and didn't do her husband any political favors when she opened up her mouth. I mean, like, she, she, she talked about stuff that was just not to be talked about. But until she did, no one else was. So she's who opened it up. And here's the greatest thing I learned about Betty Ford. When, when Betty was young, she was a, she was a child, uh, model in like department store magazines and she was a dancer she went to uh, some I, the, the name escapes me but a very famous uh, dance salon so she was she was born and raised uh, she was born in chicago but raised in michigan so in grand rapids michigan you've got the uh, president ford presidential uh, library museum and you can go there and they have so many things from betty ford so many things from i mean you know their president and first lady uh, during a bicentennial during during 1976 when a lot of famous people from around the world came and there were a lot of celebrations in washington dc so just the gifts of state and the, the 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 queen and 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 prince of of, of England came. Prince Philip and, and Queen Elizabeth came uh, uh, to to visit and go to a big state dinner. And all other people from all different countries in France and everything came. So they were really really partying in 1976. And the Fords were at the at the head of all that and hosting all of that great celebration for America. And um and and Betty Ford started out as I say a child child uh, uh, model and things like that. She was. A dancer and she danced on broadway and off broadway uh performances and things like that and here's a cool thing you ever make mixtapes when you were a kid yeah i mean everyone did right and i was a drummer from a very young age and very into music and i come from a musical family and i would get my maxell my blank maxell tapes and i would go to the big kids on the block or, or, or i would go to the record store and i'd want to record those albums onto tape so i could listen to them in the car or listen to them on my walkman and all that stuff and i'd write each song on the little Maxell tape label or TDK, and you try and draw the, the the font of the band name. I remember, like drawing Iron Maiden and Kiss and Ramones on all these different tapes and categorize them, keep them in my box. Well, Nancy or uh, 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 Betty Ford, rather, she had an album, a a a, 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 a collective album that housed all of her seventy eight records, and they were big bands like Tommy Dorsey and 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 Buddy Rich and and Gene Krupa and all these. All these big bands that she would have listened to and danced to, and she had them all categorized and handwritten. And when she was in the dorm at the at the, at the dance school, you know, she had she had notes on that said, "Please return the right record to the right sleeve and the right cat." She was so so categorized in particular about her music collection. It just made her real to me. It made her so real to me that that she would have this essentially like you know like like I carried my little box of tapes around. She had this this album of, of hard uh, brown uh, almost like construction paper or like like a shopping bag construct uh, brown paper that would house all these 78 records that she could carry around with her to the dorms and girlfriend's house and things like that and and dance classes and dance performances it was just very endearing to see her on this personal level and um 
And uh, uh, I actually, you guys will love this, man. Outside of Grand Rapids, your own first ladies, man, Andrew Oak, has his name on a plaque in a small bar outside of Grand Rapids for eating 12 chili cheese dogs in one sitting. Nice. How long was that sitting? It was long. They the the, the bar. I, the name escapes me right now, but 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 it's it's a thing. Like hot dogs are their thing. Hot dogs and fried pickles. It's the first place I'd ever had fried pickles dipped in ranch. Um, and and <coughs> excuse me. So you've got from the time they open till the time they close to eat twelve chili cheese dogs to get your name on the wall. Then if you want to go beyond that and try and beat the record, but the record is held by a ninety-eight pound woman. That ate over a hundred hot dogs. Jesus. Yeah. That poor bathroom. I I don't even know. I don't even <laughs> have to speculate about how she fit them. I mean, if you stack up a hundred hot dogs, they were about the size of this woman. So I don't even know where she fit them when she ate them. And I'll tell you, twelve. You got you know you got big eyes, and I'm 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 a pretty confident individual, you know. And I sit down, I'm thinking this is gonna be no problem, man. And I've got as long as I want, dude. I'm telling you, twelve chili cheese dogs is a struggle, but I got it, and I got my name up, and so that's what I recommend up there in uh, up there in Grand Rapids. Well, looks like you're going back into another eating contest. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey, it's not cupcakes this time. Thank God. I can handle chili dogs. Andy, I've got something that we haven't asked about before that I think would be kind of interesting. Yeah, sure, do it. Who are some of the potential first ladies whose husbands did not win the election that you think would have been fun to do your research and learn more about? Oh, wow. That's, I tell you what, man, that's, that's one that, 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 that no one's asked me. I, C-SPAN did a series called the contenders or the would have been, you know, the guys that ran for the presidency and, and, and didn't. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of these, a lot of these guys run for president a couple different times and they don't make it and then they make it. Um, I mean, in modern times, you know, it, it's, I, Here's the thing, and, and, and it, it, sound, it'll, it will sound like I'm pushing this question off or, or, or not answering or, or, or spinning, but, but I'm really not. I was so amazed by the first ladies that I could not have named by name and the fact that if you go Martha Washington through Melania Trump, as I do in my book and as we did with the series, there is something interesting and remarkable about every single one of these first ladies. Something unusual, some philanthropic endeavor, some charity, some great tragedy, some great success, some great, you know, first lady first or, or female first or women's first, you know, for education or voting or, 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 or uh, you know, adventure, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in like inventing things and, and all this stuff so that you look at any of these women that could have been first lady that, that, that haven't been or didn't, and I guarantee you, you go back, and that what was so great about this series and these books and exploring these women is that what we know about them collectively, for the most part, what we as Americans, as the about these women is during their time in the White House. But before the White House and after the White House, after the White House, like we saw with with uh, with with um, um, with Lady Bird Johnson, because she lived so much longer than her husband, or before the White House, like we see with Lou Hoover, all the great things that she did to become the the, the first female to graduate with a geology degree in America uh, from Stanford University, which is where she met her husband and where they would become self-made millionaires, become the first administration not to take a salary because they have money. They didn't want it. They're like, you know, give that money to someone else, a better cause. Now we've got uh, Hoover, Kennedy, and uh, current uh, Trump are the three administrations to not take that salary that's provided by the taxpayer and our taxpayer dollar. But there's so much that these women do before the White House and after the White House that really you can find something interesting about every single first lady. So, you know, um, um, it, I mean, hell, it would have it would have been crazy interesting to consider Bill Clinton as the first first gentleman. You know, I mean, that's the first thing that pops into mind to think 
that the first first gentleman in our country's history was potentially and it still could be i mean you know you know no one knows what's going to happen down the road but but was going to be a former president that craziness man and and i write about that in the hillary clinton chapter you know the real well, chapter. hillary didn't trust him to host all those first all those dinners with the dignitary's wives well you know what i say that publicly and, and and here's the weird thing you know in the current administration this this brings up an excellent point um uh is that what's good for one is not always good for another and what's bad for one is not always bad for another so right now donald trump's uh, uh daughter Ivanka has, has stepped in and, and got an office in the White House, and people question that and whether that's appropriate. And we didn't elect her, and why is? I mean, a president can appoint anyone, and has been forever. Family members, uh, daughters, sisters, best friends, political favors paid back. Uh, nepotism went on. Uh, you know, there was, there was almost no uh, uh, more ab 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 abused. Uh, 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 power of that position of, of appointing people than than Ulysses S. Grant. I mean, everybody that ever sold him a pair of shoes or or lent him a dime, man, got some kind of position somewhere. And a lot of them turned out to be to be great uh, appointments and and good things. It's not necessarily nepotism isn't always a bad thing. Um, but so Trump lets his daughter do some stuff where I mean, she's a very successful businesswoman and she's probably got a lot of experience in a lot of areas that that. You know, if people didn't protest so much and just kind of let the, let her use her expertise, it might turn out to be very very good. But 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 um, but uh, um, so so the point is, you're absolutely right. Hillary Clinton is smart. I don't care if you voted for, her, didn't vote for, her, love her, hate her, don't care about it. The woman is intelligent, and the woman is highly educated. And there's a difference between intelligent and educated hillary clinton happens to be both so she has a conflict as soon as she goes into office in that her husband and this was from the very first speech i gave people were asking me what are we going to call bill clinton if hillary clinton wins the presidency i'm like what are you going to call him you're going to call him president clinton that title is with you forever He'll always be President Clinton, just like President Bush was always President Bush. W, always du President Bush. President Obama, always President Obama. And when Trump gets out of office, always President Trump. If President uh, if George Washington still was alive, you would say, hello, Mr. President, or that's President Washington over there. It's just a title that sticks with you for life. That's the way it's set up. So if Hillary Clinton becomes president, you walk into the room as the king of France, president of France, whatever, you walk in and you're looking at President Clinton and President Clinton. And if you're walking in as the president of France, are you going to hand your wife over to President Bill Clinton, who's the first gentleman to say, okay, you take my wife and entertain her around town while I meet with President Hillary Clinton about the latest trade agreement or whatever. I mean... You know, there, there's there's some interesting things that pop up that some people could have a problem with or could get some bad press or put people in an awkward situation. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, because we know Bill probably kept the key to the Oval Office. <laughs> well, there's all that. But I'm saying, like, so what is Hillary Clinton going to do? Who's Who do you think is Hillary Clinton's first lady? Who do you think Hillary Clinton's hostess is going to be to, to entertain? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Chelsea Clinton knows the white house who knows the, the the procedure and the policy and and all the stuff that goes on there because she's the daughter of a president she's the daughter of a u.s senator she's the daughter of a secretary of state so where does bill clinton go how many times did you see bill clinton and hillary clinton together when she was senator when she was secretary of state you can count on one hand man she because she wanted bill clinton as far She's probably sending him to Camp David and telling him to stay there if she ever gets elected. Well, even even better yet, she does and you uses him for his strength. Bill Clinton is still wildly popular and wildly successful on the international stage. So he, so Bill Clinton becomes like Secretary of State. Maybe the first president in history to officially become the Secretary of State. Or even if 
Trump is not official, he's like deputy or the de facto or like, hey, Bill, go out and spread American cheer and American goodwill and American diplomacy. Be anywhere and everywhere except for Washington, D.C., because when President Devin comes in from France and the heavyweight chumps come in with their with their wives to go to this state dinner, Chelsea Clinton is going to host us that with her mom. Bill Clinton. Oh, where's Bill? I want to see. Oh, you know what? Bill's over in Thailand helping out with that typhoon, or Bill's down in uh, down in Somalia helping with genocide, or Bill's at the uh, United Nations in New York doing X, Y, and Z. I'm telling you, man, Bill Clinton is out of Washington D.C. more than he's in Washington D.C. And so, you know, it, that that makes for a very very interesting potential first gentleman that could have been the first first gentleman. But besides that. I mean, you know, uh, 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 Mitt Romney's wife, she's got a story of her own. And, and she's got a story of, 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 of uh, surviving a disease. I think, I think she had cancer at some point in time or some, some serious aff affliction that she's sort of conquered and gotten over. Uh, but she's a mother of a, of a lot of children. There's all those stories with those children. So what would she do with children? Or you go back to Walter Mondale's wife. There's a story there. Um, you know, it's just, they're all interesting characters because they're all humans. And when you get to that level, when you're going to go in to the White House, you've, you've, you've sailed some seas, you know, you've, you've traveled some miles, you've got some experience under your belt. So that makes any first lady or potential first lady uh, very interesting. I think, I think Bernie Sanders' wife would have been very interesting. Bernie Sanders would have been interesting in that he would have been the first Jewish president in American history. But strangely enough, his wife, not Jewish. So his wife would have been the second Catholic first lady in history. The first being Jacqueline Kennedy. And now, actually, Melania Trump uh, uh, um, associates while not practicing, but she she has she has uh, claimed allegiance and being raised Catholic and and having faith in the Catholic Church and the Catholics love it because they got another first lady. I mean, it's been a long time and there's only been one. It is it is a white Amer white Anglo-Saxon Protestant club in the White House. I mean, that's the way the country was started for religious freedoms and taxation without representation and all that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you, man, the Protestants of which I am. I I was raised Presbyterian. Um, you know, uh, they, they have more presidents and first ladies in the White House than, than, than any other denomination, than any other religion. And so anyone that comes in like a, like a Romney as a, uh, as a Mormon or a Mrs. Sanders as a, as a Catholic, that's just, a, that's just another interesting story. Or if, 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 um, uh, uh, Liebsman, or Lieberman, Joe Lieberman, he had won, um, uh, uh, his wife would have been the first Jewish first lady, and that would have been a whole story behind it. Who in her family were Holocaust survivors? Who served in which war? And what country were they from? Kind of thing, and how they got to this country. So, it, 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 when you, all people are interesting on some level, but but that's just kind of a kind of broad broad strokes of of, of what I think about of of the, the the folks that didn't get into the White House. They also ran, as we say. Yeah. Um, now, to close this out, I've never asked this question. Tell us your favorite first lady. Yeah. And you cannot say Heather. <laughs> well, you know, you know that Heather is the first lady's man's first lady for sure. So, you know, she... She's, she's, she's definitely my favorite lady, but, um, um, uh, next to my late mother, of course. And I, and I dedicate these books and, and this, this, uh, uh, whole project to her because she didn't live long enough to see it, sadly, but she would have loved this. I mean, the fact that uh, she was very politically active, uh, locally, uh, in, in Maryland, always worked the polls when I was growing up. And, you know, she's, she's the reason I, I hold women in the great respect that I do. She was a strong woman. She always chaperoned my, my school events and was, uh, a den leader when I was a Cub Scout, a very active, a fun lady. Uh, Heather and I were talking about this last night. No girl I ever took to any homecoming or any prom ever had store bought corsage. My mom taught me how to make them. And she said that 
each girl is going to feel special because they're there with you and they're going to have a flower that no other girl has from Giant or Safeway or Kroger or, you know, the local florist. She bought all the parts individually and bought the, the, the florist tape and the individual pin. Just a, just a remarkable, remarkable woman. But, but if, if my feet are held to the fire, you know, and, and I mean, it, it's hard to pick one. I can't pick just one and say this is the all time my absolute favorite. But but if if you're saying I gotta give you an answer, who's my favorite? Who would I like to hang out with? Who would I like to go back in time or, or spend current time with in, in any capacity? I would have to say it's Lou Hoover. Lou Hoover is is a first lady that that no one listening, I promise you, uh, w- would list uh, if if they were if they were told to. to the list 5 10 15 20 30 30 first ladies until this uh, episode i didn't know what a first name was well there you go (laughs) hey and i'll tell you what you know the johnny cash song a boy named sue yeah well this is a girl named lou lou's not short for louise Her, her father wanted a son and 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 got a daughter and named her lou and then they moved to California, and he took her camping, and taught her how to shoot, and taught her how to ride a horse, and taught her how to hike, and how to build a fire, and pitch a tent, and she was taught in a way that was unusual for women. But in 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 her teens, in her early teens, for school composition, she wrote something in the 1800s that I, I, I'm I'm not kidding you. I'm I'm secure enough. In, in my in my in my in my own skin and my, my manhood to tell you that I, I sometimes I get misty. I, I tear up talking about the, the remarkable woman that Lou Hoover is. She wrote this in the eighteen hundreds when she was a teenager, a, 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 a school essay called Independent Girl. And to think of how women were treated and still to a certain point as as a minority as less than, as someone that didn't have the right to an education, didn't have the right to vote, didn't have the right to a job, or should should be ignored because they were a woman, or couldn't do something because they were a woman, all these other things. And this, this budding young spirit writes Independent Girl and talks about how an independent girl can go out and change the world, and she'll find an independent man. They will understand this independent girl and they will either clash like titans or they will join forces and rise from fires of Phoenix and conquer what is in front of them. And every single thing that Lou Hoover was presented with as a problem, she found a solution. She did more for women and more for girls and more for Americans and human beings than, than, than almost any other first lady in the White House. Their, their philanthropic endeavors, their selflessness, their willingness to pay for because they had the money. And, and they didn't come from money. They weren't Kennedys. They weren't Bushes. They weren't, you know, uh, 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 people of means. They made their fortune. President Hoover was a, was an orphan. He went to Stanford University because he had an uncle that lived in California. And, and, uh, and he heard that, that, um, that if you, if you had California residency, you got a free college education. And because he didn't have money or any other way to get an education, he moved to California, lived with a family member, and, and went to Stanford, because he's a smart guy. But by the time they're 30, they're multimillionaires, and they've gone around the world multiple times. Hoover proposed to Lou in a telegram from Australia in, 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 I, what I only, I think the, the early 1900s, it would have to be the early 1900s, it wasn't the late 1800s. But, but in, in, eight, I mean, in, in early 1900s, he proposes to her while he's mining gold in Australia. And she says, yes. She goes, come back to San Francisco, just get hitched, pick me up, and then I'm off with you. I just finished college. I got a geology degree myself. Then she taught herself seven different languages, including Mandarin Chinese, while they were living in China during the Boxer Rebellion. And she writes back a letter to one of her friends saying, you know, Susie, it's too bad you didn't come with us to China. We're having a great time over here. Things are really hitting the fan, and I got my bicycle tires shot out from under me as I was riding through Tiananmen Square with a six-shooter packed on my side. And you should be here for all the fun. Then she helped start the, the U.S. Girl Scouts based on an organization she'd seen in London right around the time of the breakout of World War I when they were over there mining pewter in London and then used all of their own funds, their 
their their their their own money to help U.S. diplomats, citizens get their wives and children out of Europe before World War One really plowed through and people started getting hurt and they didn't even want to be paid back and they didn't even want the recognition these are just good people doing good things because it was the right thing to do and that's what if i could sum up with any of this all of these first ladies whether you vote for their husbands whether you like their husbands whether you even necessarily like them or what they're doing they are not paid and they are not elected and they stand up and just try and make the world a better place even if it's not a way that you personally think it's going to get better they're still trying because they don't have to do anything. They're not paid. They're not elected. There's no job description. You can't take First Ladies 101 in school. And a lot of these women, like we started off saying, have hitched their wagons to these up-and-coming stars, these men early in our country, these lawyers that were that were formulating the, 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 the very rules and society that would become America. And think about the world without America. The, the global world economy is different. There's no McDonald's, no Harley Davidson, no Coca-Cola. World War One, World War Two, all these conflicts look very, very different. The world is a different place without one of the most important societies, cultures, and countries in the modern world. And it's all because Martha Dandridge Custis found and married George Washington and because he used her money and her status and her ability to, to, to do what he did in the American Revolution to make us a country. So these women have been, have been boosting up, supporting, and facilitating their husbands from the very beginning. And then, although not paid and not elected themselves, have been working towards the betterment of mankind. And I think when we work together like that, and knowing that these women are part of this equation and part of this whole structure and this infrastructure and this foundation of our country, that we move together in a future better together. I don't think there's a better way to say it, and there's not a better way to sum it up. I think the only thing that we can say is, once again, we are in awe of your knowledge of the First Ladies, and we don't feel <laughs> quite as stupid when we get done talking to you. Um, <laughs> but again, Andy, we want to thank you for coming on. It's always a great time. Uh, you know this is not the last time. No, no, guys. Any and every time you guys got you, you get me thinking and you get my juices flowing and, and and get me thinking of these women in different ways because you ask different questions, man. And I, I love coming on your show. I love bringing this kind of perspective and spreading the word. Uh, and, you know, if, if people listening, if you like what you hear, I mean, keep listening to the to the to the heavyweight chumps, of course. Uh, but but also go to firstladiesman.com. You can get all my interviews there, all my articles. Uh, the C-SPAN series is on there. You can order the books, watch the videos, read the articles, see the updates, look at the pictures, all the kind of stuff, and have a good time because that's all I'm trying to do is promote these women in a good time and take a little bit of, a little bit of look on it, a different, different perspective on politics that doesn't make you want to punch somebody or throw up. And for those of you that don't know, the, uh, the intro that plays for our show every week and has now for about six, six months, about six months the man on the drums is the man on the other end of this call. What do you do? What? What? What's, what am I missing here? What's, what's been playing in the intro? Uh, we, we use ghetto metal as our intro music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, good stuff, man. Yeah, he rocks out too, folks. Oh yeah, man! You gotta have gotta have fun, man. You only get you only get so much time on this planet. And have a good time while you're doing it. Do some good work. Uh, make your mark and and teach people a few things and make people smile. That's what I try and do. And you do a good job of it, Andy. And again, thank you for coming on. We will have you back. Can't wait to talk to you again, man. Take care. All right, take take care, fellas. Happy pre Happy President's Day, Day, bud. Bye. See you, man. That was, again, we always leave out of talking with Andy going, well, I didn't know that, right? I, I Now I also know that you need to go train for eating chili dogs. Uh, um, that's all we can say. Uh, for those out there in the military that are serving, uh, I've got friends to, to my friend, Sergeant Jonathan Hudson, 
get your ass back home, buddy. We're ready to see you. Uh, time to have you on the show and have you share some experiences from your time and multiple tours now over into into the Middle East. Uh, to all of those that have got family and loved ones that are serving and those that are serving themselves, we want to take this time to thank you for your service and for keeping this country the great and free thing that it is. Even if we don't agree with the actions of the man in charge. We may not all agree on that, but we can all support our men and women who are fighting for this country to keep those freedoms in our hands so that we have the right to disagree with what our leaders say. That's right. Freedom comes at a price. And with that, guys, we want to tell you again, Happy President's Day. We'll be back for Film Fest Fridays. Until then, same fat time, same fat channel.